Welcome everybody. Here we are today with Hannah Gell. She is a doula and she specializes in VBAC and in, which is vaginal birth after cesarean and also in cesarean. She's a childbirth educator. She's joining us from about 30 minutes outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, which is in the United States. And uh, she's come to share her knowledge with us about how to support women and how you can find support if you're deciding to have a cesarean or a feedback birth, because those are births that um, do carry their own set of, of challenges and difficulties. So it's always nice to have someone there to support. Thanks for coming on, Hannah. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to have you. We had three segments to our audience, and those are people who are before they're married and preparing themselves as an individual and trying to find the right partner. And then we have people who are married with families and they are trying to juggle and balance and do all that incredibly important work in family life. And then the middle segment is when women are having fertility or pregnancy and leading up to childbirth, because that is sort of the the transition, the period of matrescence where you turn from a woman into a, a mother. So that's where we're focusing today with you. And we're grateful that you can be here because there are so many different types of births and pregnancies that women can go through. So we're just in here in your speciality. Yes, thank you. That's exactly what I enjoy talking about. Um, I talk about all those areas as well, but primarily pregnancy, birth, and postpartum are where I love focusing my energy. So brilliant. Let's start with your own background, if you don't mind, where you yes. grew up and, and where you're, how you became your whole story of, of starting off in life and so where we are now to you today. Yeah, so I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, but only briefly lived there um, as a baby. And then I've spent the majority of my life in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the surrounding areas. And I've also lived in several other states, um, Florida, Tennessee, Nebraska, uh, kind of all over the place. But the majority of the time has been in Indiana. And I actually met my husband in high school. So our high school sweethearts, um, we've known each other for a very long time. I've been together for 14 years and married for seven years. And uh, before I had kids, I went to grad school. My backgrounds in human biology and forensic science. So um, like all the true crime stuff that everyone is into. Uh, and then at the end of grad school, I got pregnant with my first, my son, and everything just kind of changed from there. So I changed trajectory on what I wanted to do professionally and what I wanted to do personally. And it was really the birth experience that I had with him. I had an unplan unplanned cesarean that kind of catapulted me into birth work. Um, I went through a lot of birth trauma, postpartum depression, PTSD, all of that, and had to really process all of that. And I knew if I had any more children, I would want to have something different happen. Uh, so that's kind of what got me into birth work. At first, I became a childbirth educator because I was really let down and disappointed by the birth class that I took, and I wanted to provide something different for women preparing for pregnancy and birth and postpartum. And then it was after my experience with my doula personally, with my second birth, which was a VBAC, that I decided I wanted to become a doula because it was such an amazing experience and I wanted to provide that same support to women. Brilliant. So what were the deficiencies that you found in your birth class that you feel, because I know a lot of people feel the exact same way. Mm -hmm. as, so yeah. Yeah, when I was preparing, I didn't really know there were other birth class options besides just what was provided through the hospital. So I just took a general childbirth education class through the hospital. I knew that I wanted to go unmedicated. So the hospital also offered like a advanced labor class is what they called it um, to get through birth without an epidural. So that's all I did. And I didn't really do much else to prepare, but classes were very much specific to that hospital and I, I know a lot of people hear that as well and I don't really feel like it went over all of my options and choices and it didn't prepare me for the potential that a c-section could happen so 
I just thought, oh, that just happens in emergency situations. Um, that would never happen to me. I don't even have to worry about preparing for that. And then it did happen. And I did not feel prepared on how to handle my options for that or how to go through the process. So really, I just felt like it wasn't preparing me for everything that could potentially happen. And if it does happen, how to handle it. I've heard that story before. <laughs> And it seems like it's a sad story because you would you would think that there is, um, I know they're limited on time, but you would think that there is an obligation to provide the full array of of options and not just funnel you along about what benefits the hospital. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, can you tell us? I would love to hear. Um, and hopefully this doesn't trigger anybody listening. But as a sort of before and after snapshot and as a maybe happy ending, could you tell us the difference without getting hopefully too, um, too terribly graphic, but the difference between just your first birth and then we could talk maybe about how you went through the trauma recovery and worked with your doula and then maybe we could hear your after story later on. When things turn yeah. out well. Okay. Yeah. So with um, my first, like I said, I didn't do much else to prepare besides just taking normal childbirth education classes. And I had planned to go unmedicated, but I thought, okay, I took a class. I'll just walk in. Everything's going to be fine. I won't get an epidural. It'll be good. And then when my contractions, my labor started, um, I immediately thought I'm getting an epidural. There's no way I'm going to get through this. Uh, so as soon as we got to the hospital, I basically said, they asked me what I wanted to do to manage my pain. And I said, I want an epidural. And I got that right away. And after that, it just, I basically napped <laughs> until I needed to push. And it was just the basic, like, okay, your 10 centimeters, let's start pushing now. And of course I had an epidural. So I wasn't, I didn't know that I could move around, change positions with an epidural other than moving from side to side, like changing sides that you're laying on. And unfortunately, my my labor and delivery nurse just wasn't great about presenting me with options and um, telling me that I should be moving around to get myself and baby in a good position as much as possible, even with an epidural. So I just napped basically until it was time to push. And I think I pushed way too early, um, honestly, because I ended up pushing for four hours before my C-section. And um, it was most people would say, oh, gosh, weren't you exhausted? But my epidural was so strong that I couldn't even feel the need to push. I didn't know how to push. It was just I was so numb, nothing. I wasn't even tired, honestly. And um, my son ended up being asynclitic. So his head was like cocked sideways. So it was not lined up with the birth canal um, to come out straight. And around nine centimeters is when they broke my water. And because I was just like hovering at nine and, and I looking back now, obviously um, hindsight's twenty twenty, but there was no reason to have my water broken. I, my labor was progressing fine. It was fast. Um, so it was really just after that, that four hour mark where his head was just sideways, he wasn't descending that my OBGYN said, would you like to consider cesarean as an option? And I, I do want to just side note this. My OBGYN was wonderful. She was so supportive. She was trying everything she could to prevent that cesarean. Um, and at that point, I didn't know um, that there could be another option. So I just said, yes, that's fine. Let's go forward with the C-section. And the C-section itself and afterwards was where the, the trauma really happened for me and just not knowing how to handle it. Um, I, I won't get... get in too, in the, uh, too much into detail, but just not remembering hearing my son cry, um, that type of thing. So, and not really having that, that bonding experience. And then I also in recovery had some issues because I had some extra blood loss and um, hypotension. So really low blood pressure, which I have low blood pressure anyway, but then that just made everything worse. Um, so just not having that bonding experience. And then there were some other traumatic things that happened immediately postpartum. 
as well. That caused a lot of uh, PTSD for me and some excessive pain that I don't think uh, a lot of people go through. But I knew immediately as soon as we left the hospital that if we were to have more kids, I could not have that happen again. And at that time, I didn't know VBAC or vaginal birth after cesarean was a thing. I just assumed everyone that had a C-section, like you could have a vaginal birth with no problem. Like why would you have to have another C-section? And then when I got into the weeds of the research, I realized, oh, there's a lot of um, controversy around this. There's a lot of pushback on having a vaginal birth after cesarean. And this is going to be a little bit different than I had planned on going forward with future births. So basically from as soon as I got home, I started researching options. Even though I had no idea when I would have another child, I just knew I couldn't have that happen again. So I spent a year and a half about before I got pregnant again, just doing research, looking into options, listening to other women's stories that were similar to mine. I found a lot of Instagram pages and Facebook groups and all that to find a sense of community of people that went through what I went through or something similar. And I, it's funny because I started interviewing doulas before we even conceived um, because I knew that I wanted to find the best fit for me. And as soon as I got out, I was pregnant. I wanted to be able to hire someone. And my doula was wonderful. She's been a doula for over 20 years now. And she also specializes in VBAC. So she has attended many, many VBAC births. And then as far as healing from the trauma, I didn't realize that I had something going on like personally until about six months postpartum. So I was dealing with postpartum depression, um, but mainly anxiety and PTSD as far as like flashbacks to the trauma and the birth and having the nightmares and all of that. And there was a point where I, I almost blamed my son and um, when I was in like my lowest point was like, why did, why weren't you in a good position? Like, why could I not birth you because you were stuck this way? And looking back now, I'm like, why would I ever blame my, my baby for that? But when I was at my lowest point, that was what I was thinking. Like I didn't, we had this birth because you were in a bad position, but I felt like the trauma also made us bond more. It was almost a, like a trauma bond, which sounds horrible, but we went through something so traumatic together, but I feel like that strengthened our relationship because we both had to heal together. And it was around six months postpartum that I started going to therapy, which was extremely, extremely helpful. Just to have someone outside of my family and friends validate my experience. And I knew that they weren't just saying it because they were my family or friend. And so that was very, very helpful um, in just really talking it through and processing it. And I also found because so many women who have unplanned cesareans or traumatic birth experiences, a lot of the trauma comes from a lack of, a sensing of lack of control. And looking back at my like hospital notes um, and my, my reports and um, from the surgery and just really seeing what happened and why something may have happened or just understanding because when you're in it, you're not really absorbing everything. So looking back on that was really helpful for helping me process uh, the full birth experience. And I felt like processing all that trauma was the number one thing I had to do before getting pregnant again, because I knew there would be mental blocks and even physical blocks from that trauma. So before I even got pregnant again, I, I wanted to make sure that my mind and my body were were healed from that experience. Wow. I wanted to ask, um, with the birth itself, going back to that just briefly, you said you didn't remember hearing your son cry. Mm -hmm. Were you under a general anesthetic? I was not, um, but during my C-section, when they started, I felt way more pain than I thought I was supposed to be feeling. Okay. So I had my husband ask the anesthesiologist to just give me something more. Um, I, they didn't knock, like knock me out with um, general anesthetic, but 
they did give me something else and I did end up like dozing off or, or falling asleep, um, but not under general. And when I finally like woke up um, from falling asleep, my husband was saying, babe, it's a boy because we didn't know. Um, but I don't remember hearing him cry and I just kind of kind of dozed off again after that. And then be in recovery because of my low blood pressure and my blood loss, I was very unstable. So I had to have my husband like hold my son so I could nurse him because I could not hold him. So I'm sitting here like basically passing now and my husband's holding him so I can nurse him. And yeah, it was a mess, but I don't remember. It was very blurry. And then coming away from that and realizing later, oh, I have trauma. This is inhibiting our bond. How was it that you came to that realization? Because a lot of women won't. They won't understand. How did you identify? This is something I need to address. It was mainly... I that's the, sorry, yeah. I, was just, I guess that's the first step toward healing. Yeah, is really just knowing that something's wrong. Um, so with the, the trauma and the PTSD in general, I really started noticing that when like six months had passed and I was still having nightmares about it. And I would still like look at my son and just cry thinking about our birth experience and like, why did this happen? And then with like the postpartum anxiety and rage, my tipping point was really, I was in the drive through so I can't remember where, I think it was at the pharmacy or something. And there was a long line, there was cars in front of me, cars behind me. My son was screaming, um, just crying because I mean, newborns cry, especially when they're in their car seat sometimes. And I was so triggered by his crying that I started crying because I had so much anxiety because I couldn't get to him basically because we were in this line. So I literally got out of the car, had the people behind me back up so I could leave and get out of line and get home to him and get him out of his seat. So at that point, I knew something that like, this is not normal. This is not okay. I need to go talk to someone about how I'm feeling. And did you find someone who specialized in postpartum trauma? Yes. Was... Okay. Yeah. So I specifically, um, I, I talked to my OBGYN first and I said, I really need to see a therapist of some sort um, because I need to talk through this. So I made sure that she gave me a bunch of options and I researched um, someone that had experience with postpartum mood disorders. And is it something that you still have residually or is it? You feel you've healed, you've gone past this, and now had to be birth. So I feel like in relation to my birth, I feel completely healed from that. Um, and I've currently, actually, I'm, I'm doing EMDR therapy for some other traumas as well in the past, but I feel like it's been helpful for my birth as well because we've, we've processed that. Um, so just continually trying to do that. But overall, I feel like I'm, I'm healed and I can accept my birth. I'm not, I don't look back on the birth as like, oh, this was such a joyous day. Um, there's still emotions surrounding that and that's okay. Um, but I accept that it happened and I was able to move forward and have a, a, a healing birth without having those mental or physical blocks that I was worried about. And when you say that you and your son healed together, what do you mean by that? How do you how do you see a healing happen with him? So our one thing I was really concerned about with the C section was uh, like our breastfeeding relationship because so many women say that if they've had a C section, whether whether scheduled or not, um, it can inhibit their breastfeeding. And breastfeeding for us was was our bonding source and that was those moments, those sessions, especially because he was my first child, it was uninterrupted. So we really bonded there. And even as a baby, I would talk him through the birth experience and just let him know. And um, just recently, like, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, he asked like, well, how did I come out of your belly, mommy? And I've walked him through his birth experience. And I, I want him to know that it's nothing that he did even though in those moments I felt like it was um, and that we were able to get through it together and that his birth may have looked different than his sister's, but it's still just as important to me. So. 
That's so beautiful. I hope any woman who's listening to this right now who has had that experience and is possibly still holding on or, or having trauma, that they can see a light and a ray of hope through that because that can get overwhelming quickly, especially if you're dealing with postpartum depression to, to feel like there's someone out there who has made it to the other side. I think your story is really good for that. Thank you. Thank you. So when you decided to look for a, a doula and then decided to have another baby, walk us through the process that she went with you for advocating for you. I'm sure she had to advocate for you to have a be back and how she supported you and how the birth went. Yeah. So I was really looking for someone, not necessarily that was specialized in VBAC, but just someone that had knowledge of it and um, knew how to properly support someone through that process. Because as much as we want it to be the same as a first time vaginal birth, it's not. We know that there is stigma around it. We know that there's controversy and pushback and um, different things involved. So I wanted someone that just had more experience in the system and how to navigate that. So um, she was the first doula I interviewed and we ended up coming back to her and I wanted someone that I connected with emotionally as well and personally. So I didn't want someone to just show up to my birth and do all of that. I really wanted to develop a relationship with her and because she's been a doula so long, she is older and I really felt um, a maternal um, kind of connection with her and like she was helping guide me in that way too. So the biggest thing that she went through was again, really just walking through my first birth experience and seeing where the, the issue arose um, as far as like how I was presenting it to her. So obviously pushing was a big concern for me because I pushed for so long before. And one of the main reasons I wanted to hire a doula was because I wanted to make sure I was going to go unmedicated the second time around because I knew that having an epidural posed its own challenges with the birth and could potentially cause additional risks or um, positioning issues like it had prior where I just just confined to the bed. So I really wanted that physical comfort support to get through uh, labor unmedicated. So she really worked on comfort measures and uh, she has experience with hypnobabies, which is a hypnobirthing program that I ended up doing that uh, focus on, focuses on sorry, my dogs are parking, sorry, um, focuses on uh, hypnosis for birth and breath work. So she really worked with me through that. And then just making sure that I had a supportive birth team. I went through in Indiana, I'll mention it's illegal to have a VBAC in a birth center because originally when I had planned my VBAC, I wanted to be in a birth center and then I realized that wasn't an option for me, unfortunately. So I decided to go the home birth route and that also ended up logistically being challenging because the closest home birth midwife to me that would take on a primary VBAC, which means a VBAC without a prior vaginal birth was about two hours away. And I was concerned with the distance for driving for appointments and, and all of that. And then if the midwife would make it in time. So I opted just to stay in the hospital system. So she really helped me find options for supportive VBAC providers. Um, at the end of the day, though, I ended up staying with my OB that had did my C-section uh, because like I said, she was so supportive. And when I asked her about VBAC, she just said, well, yeah, like you can have VBAC, that's fine. And she was one of the only providers I had talked to and heard about that didn't put any stipulations on me. So a lot of providers will require like an epidural or require induction by a certain date um, for VBAC. And she was the only one that I felt comfortable with um, respecting my options completely. And I even had looked at um, like a hospital midwifery pro uh, practice as well um, in Indianapolis. But again, 
just thinking about driving through all that downtown traffic to get to appointments, I was not feeling that. So my doula really helped me navigate all that. She was supportive at the end of the day of the choice that I made to stay with my my OB that did my C-section. So. Your OB sounds amazing. I know a lot of stuff about. Yes, um, and she moved too. So she's uh, no longer in our area. She's at a different area. And anyone that's in the area she moved to, I'm like, please go to her because she's amazing. <laughs> what area is she in now? So she's down in Bloomington and she's actually like a laborist now. So she doesn't see clients um, like in clinic. So now she just is on call for, she's on the on-call OB basically at the hospital. Wow. That's got to be a really fulfilling mm -hmm. uh, job to be there for the birth all the time. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, with what you just mentioned, I heard so many archaic and or mystical, mythological beliefs concerning bee bags. So I'd like to um, talk about some of those. What, And then uh, we'll get to your son's birth. But I'd like to talk about, first off, what you wish you would have known when you first went through your initial labor and birth. And then what you're glad that you learned and what I, well, let's start with that. There's a few more, but let's start with those two. Okay. So uh, as far as what I wish I would have known before my first birth, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. So I wish I would have known all of my options for birth location because I had no idea that a birth center outside of a hospital was a thing. I just thought there was hospital and home birth. So if I would have known about a birth center the first time around, I probably just would have done that. And I didn't, because I'm no one around me and my family or friend group has given birth outside of a hospital, I didn't know that was an option. And of course, a hospital birth class is not going to tell me about my options outside of a hospital. So I wish I would have known that first. And then I wish I would have known the work that it actually takes and the preparation it takes to go into birth unmedicated. You can't just decide oh, I'm going to birth unmedicated and do nothing to prepare your mind or body. And it's, I do want to make that, that point. Um, it's a lot of, about your mind because my, my pain tolerance didn't change between my first and second birth. My mind prep did and my ability to control my breathing and my body is what really changed. So those are the two main things I wish I would have known the first time. And is that the same as the things you're glad you learned or in specifically with me back and working with your doula? What are some of the things that you're glad you learned, but also glad you learned in relation to working with the system that you are working in, if that makes sense? Yeah. So I'm glad that I learned that um, hospital policies cannot, they're not law and they can't be forced upon you. So I'm glad I learned that I had the option to say no to things because as most people don't realize when they're just working with the medical system is you're hiring them to work for you and support you in your birth. So you're allowed to ask for a new provider, ask for a new nurse, decline whatever you want to decline as long as you know the risks and benefits and why you're declining it or why you're choosing it. So knowing that I, I had options and I had rights um, to make those choices for myself was a huge thing that I wanted to, that I learned because the first time around, I just went with the flow and uh, just did whatever was recommended to me. So knowing my options and how to really advocate for myself, um, thankfully, I didn't need to. Uh, I had a very supportive team. So I didn't need to advocate for myself. And my doula really didn't need to advocate for me either. Um, but knowing that and then obviously the, the breath work and learning how to prepare my body and mind for birthing and medicated was 100% worth it. And everyone should do that. If they're planning to go unmedicated is really put in the work ahead of time. And it's going to take preparation. Um, it's not just something where you can listen to your hypnobirthing tracks every now and then. Like it takes time. I listen to my tracks every single day and I practice my breath work every day, even with a toddler at home. So <laughs> yeah, it definitely it helps your, your mind and your body prepare. Because you're retraining your brain and you're retraining the cells throughout your body to 
receive those um, relaxing chemicals that you send out when you do your breath work or when you do your relaxations. And it's a really, really useful tool for that. I think you're completely right about that. With your doula, the one that you had there for you during your birth, um, did she work with you and your spouse throughout the process? Yes. So um, for one of our prenatals, we have like a comfort measure. So we practice the hypnobaby's um, scripts and what he would do if if he needed to support me in that. Um, and she helped him no different positioning and counter pressure and, and all of that, just in case um, I wanted one or the other to be supporting me at a certain time. Um, and I'm glad she helped him because... Uh, I'll get, we'll get to this later, but my birth was so fast, she almost didn't make it. So. so it's a good thing he was prepared. Yes. I have had, um, with my births, I feel like I could not have got through them without my husband and without his support. What you were talking about, counter pressure, emotional support, just that connection with somebody that you love so much makes a huge difference. I think a lot of people underestimate that. Well, yeah, because, I mean, oxytocin is the the birth hormone and it's the love hormone and it gets stirred up when you're with someone you love and you're comfortable with. So having that support there was so, so beneficial. Um, and even if my doula had never made it, I, th I think it still would have been just fine because he did wonderfully. Brilliant. So you've gone through the initial, um, I, I would say your story is almost sadly very very um common in a lot of ways is that women go through this sort of um what would you could conveyor belt of care perhaps come in we'll teach you this now we'll have the epidural because you're going to have pain so you need to have an epidural because which um that's also a, another myth that needs to be broken is the labor must be painful that's not accurate um and anybody who just their jaw just dropped when I said that there's a lot of science behind that please so it's not me drawing that off the cuff it is a very um uh, there's a lot of reasons why people think labor is painful but just so you know it is actually not true that it must be so there are lots of things you can do to bring out your own counterbalancing hormones and uh, doulas help with that as well hip breathing helps with that as well and then you've gone through this um epidural moving on to a cesarean which again is a very common thing and then having trauma which is very real after that and you've gone through all of that and working on healing your trauma you found a doula she is working with you and your spouse and it's coming into where you're finally going into labor so can you carry us forward from there yeah so I had planned uh, the second time around to labor at home as long as possible. One of the reasons I got a doula, I just wanted to basically go in pushing uh, so I wouldn't have to be in the hospital any longer than I needed to. But around, so I will mention this, second babies don't always come faster. <laughs> uh, so I went into labor spontaneously both times. Um, the first was 39 plus one, and that was after a membrane sweep, the day prior. Um, and then my second one, I went into labor at 40 plus two and I had no cervical checks throughout my pregnancy. I didn't have any membrane sweeps, none of that the second time around because I just knew it would mess with my mental state and I knew it didn't matter <laughs> until I was in labor. So I went to labor at 40 plus two, but I didn't realize it was labor when it started. I had some excessive bleeding, um, that morning and no contractions, um, just a lot of bleeding. So I called my doula, I called my OBGYN. They both obviously recommended I go in because excessive bleeding can be a concern, um, especially with a VBAC. You just never know what it may be. So I wasn't having contractions. We went to the hospital early that morning. It was around uh, like five or six, I think. And when I got there, uh, they did a check um, just to make sure, obviously, see where the bleeding was coming from. I was about three centimeters, four, three to four centimeters dilated, which is actually how dilated I was my first birth when I got to the hospital too. 
and they couldn't really tell um, where the bleeding was coming from. It ended up um, resolving pretty quickly. Um, they were at first concerned about a potential placental abruption, um, which is what their main concern was. But I was fine. Um, my daughter, um, we didn't know she was a girl at the time again, but um, she was fine too. Everything was measuring great as far as uh, heart rate and all of that. And they just assumed um, because it wasn't a placental abruption, but how I had a partial previa at one point in my pregnancy. So they just thought, well, maybe because your placenta is lower, closer to your cervix. Sorry, I'm just diet. gonna I'm just gonna oh. pause you there to if yeah. you could tell what um, a partial previa is for yes. those who don't know. So a placenta previa, if it's complete, it's where your placenta is completely covering your cervix. Um, if you have a complete previa, that is an automatic scheduled C-section because, of course. As you start to dilate, um, your placenta would pull away from your uterus and it's block, there's a block on the cervix so the baby could not get through anyway. Um, I had a partial previa throughout mine, so the placenta was only partially covering my cervix, not completely. Um, so it just, as my uterus stretched and baby grew, uh, the placenta moved away from my cervix. And every OB is different on how far away they want your placenta to be from your cervix to have a vaginal birth. I think mine was like two to three centimeters or something. So it was still pretty low, but it was cleared of my cervix. So that's what that is. And they just assumed the bleeding was coming from that because I was dilating quickly and the placenta was very close to my cervix. Um, so that was where the bleeding was coming from. But we were there at the hospital being monitored for about an hour. And because I wasn't having contractions that I could feel. I was just planning on going home after that and, and laboring at home since we were both doing fine. But after an hour, I had already progressed another centimeter and we just decided like we're here, let's just stay. It's fine. <laughs> um, and at that point I was starting to like feel my contractions a little bit, um, but they weren't anything unbearable or unmanageable. And my doula knew I was there and she just told me to keep her updated on how things were going because at that point I was four centimeters. So my thought was it's going to be a while. <laughs> um, but we got back to the, uh, like we were admitted to our, our labor room and I was also group B strep positive. Um, so it's, that's, I'm sure most people know about that because most people here, at least everyone gets tested, but it's group B strep which is a bacteria that is in all of our bodies, um, but sometimes it can be present in um, like your vagina or your rectum, and it can pass to baby potentially if you have it in the in your vaginal canal. Um, you go back and forth from being positive and negative. It could be there and colonize or not. And if you are colonized, there's no guarantee it will pass to your baby, but it is a possibility. And the treatment is obviously antibiotics because it's a bacteria. So I did choose to get the antibiotics. I did not decline those. Um, and one of the big things for my birth was I didn't want a continuous IV. So when we got admitted, I got my first round of antibiotics and then disconnected from the IV so I could move around. Um, that was a, a big thing for me. I wanted to be able to move freely. And at that point, um, things started picking up as far as my contractions went. And then my water broke. <laughs> at uh on its own at five centimeters all in the bed uh, as soon as my antibiotics were done and i let my doula know that and she said oh things are picking up rather quickly <laughs> maybe i will head that way um so she did start heading that way and after i disconnected from the uh, um, iv for the antibiotics i just felt like i wanted to be on the toilet um i tried the peanut ball between my legs because I still thought it was early labor and everything was fine. I could nap <laughs> and listen to my hypno baby's tracks. Um, and I tried that and I just did not feel comfortable in bed. I, I wanted to be on the toilet. So um, I sat on the toilet and quickly entered transition about 45 minutes later. <laughs> so um, I was hot and sweaty. I basically stripped, I was stripped down naked um, because I was just in it. <laughs> and my husband was getting me cooling washcloths and rubbing my shoulders. And again, my doula was not there yet. 
Um, and it was at that point when I was in transition and anyone who has had an unmedicated birth or a birth with a very low dose epidural, you will know this in transition is when you feel like you can't do it anymore. And at that point I told my husband, I need an epidural. <laughs> I told my nurse, I need an epidural. And they were both like, but you're doing so well. Are you sure? <laughs> um, and thankfully my husband, uh, told me, well, let's wait for Julie, my doula, to get here and, and we'll see what she says. We'll try some different positions. And um, even my nurse was like, well, you don't have an IV. It's going to take us at least 20 minutes to get your fluids going. So we'll re like we'll reconsider it at that point. And it was at that time when my doula walked in, <laughs> she was like running. Uh, and I asked her, I said, why are my contractions just on top of each other? Like, why is it so hard? <laughs> she said, well, that's just because your body's getting ready for your baby to come out. And I knew in the back of my mind, because of all the prep I did, I, was, I know I'm in transition, but I'm a denial right now. <laughs> uh, so she suggested, she was like, well, how long have you been on the toilet? I said, about an hour. And she's like, well, let's try like moving to the shower. Let's get some warm water on your back. And I was very reluctant to get off the toilet because I felt great there. I was swaying. I was doing my breathing, um, but they managed to get me in the shower. And basically, as soon as I stood up and that gravity was there, I was bearing down. Like I began pushing and I, my husband got in the shower with me. This is so funny. We forgot to pack his hospital bag. Um, I left it up to him. I was like, you can pack your own stuff. You can pack your clothes. And we did not do that. Um, so he got in the shower with his sweatpants on <laughs> um, and I was hanging around his neck and we were swaying and my doula was putting the hot water on my back and I was in the shower for probably five minutes and I was bearing down and, and fully starting to push. So I had my um, Bobby come in and do a cervical check and I had just a slight lip, uh, which is just, I wasn't fully completely dilated. I was basically 10 with a slight lip and uh my doula recommended going moving to the bed and getting on like a hands and knees position to kind of help relieve that um the rest of the cervix there but I was pushing anyway I mean I had the lip but I was still pushing my body was just doing it I couldn't control it um it this is a weird way to describe it but you know like the reflex that you have when you vomit it felt like that but just out of my body in another way <laughs> so um we did hands and knees for about five minutes of pushing and then um my doula recommended getting in a squat because my daughter just wasn't descending fully like she would come down and then go back up and in my mind i was thinking oh my gosh this is what happened the first time around like we cannot let this happen <laughs> um it was only five minutes of pushing on hands and knees before we switched to a squat and thankfully, the OB that was on call, I will mention that I did not have my regular OB. Uh, she had just gotten off a 24-hour call shift. And usually she comes to your birth, whether she's on call or not, this OB, because again, she was amazing. But she had just gotten off a 24-hour on-call shift. And I told her, like, obviously, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to expect you to come to my birth when you've been up for 24 hours. That's not going to help anyone. Um, but the OB on call was great, amazing, like very hands-off. Uh, I had never met her before, um, but she was so nice and she had no problem with me pushing in whatever position I wanted to push in, which so many OBs just want you to push on your back, regardless of if you have an epidural or not. Um, and I was not doing that. So <laughs> uh, hands and knees for five minutes. And then we used the squat bar. And about five minutes later, um, my daughter came out. So uh, she came out very, very fast. Um, my entire labor was about four and a half hours from my first contraction to when she was born. And uh, yeah, the pushing stage, I knew that was going to be the hardest for me. And it was the fastest part of the whole process. So uh, 15 minutes total of pushing before she came out. And she came out so fast, she didn't even have any head molding. Like her head was perfectly round. <laughs> That is amazing. What happened after? How did they, um, it sounds like the OBs you had very luckily were just fabulous to work with. And afterwards, how did they help you with the, um, the placenta and the breastfeeding? What, what was their procedure going forward? 
Yeah. So um, I pulled my daughter up and it was funny. My doula had mentioned before, like if you use the squat bar, make sure you, if you push her out, make sure you pull her under the bar because obviously the cord's still intact. Yeah, the cord's around. Still in. I was trying to go over because um, I was just so excited. But I was like, oh my gosh, I just had a vaginal birth. I was just so happy. I was just trying to pull her to my chest, but I was trying to go over the bar instead of under. Um, so they had to help me with that to get her under the bar and onto my chest. Um, and I was just kind of in shock, really. I was just like, oh my gosh, I just, I just did that. My husband was crying. I'm laughing and crying and just so happy. And I kind of forgot to see if she was a boy or a girl <laughs> um, for a minute. Uh, but as soon as I noticed and I was like, wait, I really need to make sure uh, that she's a girl. And she was. Um, and then we basically just started nursing right away um, because I that's what I wanted. Um, I didn't have any exams or anything on her until I asked them to do so. So um, the placenta came out. I don't even know how long time was not even on my my radar at that point, but um, I did have retained placenta, um, so pieces of it stayed in, um, but we didn't know that until about six weeks later um, when I was postpartum. So um, the placenta looked great um, at that point. I did have a marginal cord insertion on my placenta, which for the listeners, is where the umbilical cord does not attach to the center of the placenta. It's off to the edge of the placenta. Um, it's not the the one where it's the uh, the lint the limp, I don't know how to pronounce it the linimus or something cord insertion where it's um, that's where the cord is not in the actual placenta. It's attached to like some different membranes with the baby. Um, so it's just marginal. Um, but everything was great with the placenta. There were no issues um, at that time that we knew. But there was some retained placenta, which is an another reason why I hemorrhaged a little bit more uh, this time around as well. But no major concerns. And my doula helped me breastfeed, um, get, get my daughter latched. And she did great, great breastfeeding. Um, no issues there. And she did end up having later on like a, a some ties that she had revised but overall breastfeeding was not a problem and again I didn't have a epidural so I was able to get up and and move as soon as I wanted to so. brilliant and did you go into a shower straight away or just lay there I just laid there <laughs> I did not shower until the next morning and and we left 24 hours after I didn't want to stay in the hospital any longer than I needed to so we were out of there as soon as possible <laughs> So that's the actual how the how the birth happened. But what about your mental state? Yeah. So um, my mental state was actually great. Um, I did not have any major postpartum issues. I think I had probably like a little bit of postpartum anxiety, but I think a lot of times that's just a mom thing. I think we always worry, no matter what, um, no matter how many years postpartum we are. Um, but my mental state was so much, so much better. Um, obviously, I had, like I said, retained placenta. I ended up having to get uh, a DNC about six weeks postpartum to remove that. Um, so my physical state was a little uh, less optimal. Um, and we don't have to go into it fully on this episode, but my daughter was in the NICU uh, unexpectedly a week after birth. So that was a little... Um, there was some contribution to my anxiety there um, in my physical healing, trying to heal from birth while being in the hospital for a week with my daughter. So, yeah. That complicates things, but it sounds like yeah. the fact that, well, for me, I suppose the fact, my guess is that the mental state you were in was better because you were in control and you yeah. were the one who decided how things were, were going to go. Yes, I. that was a big thing for me was because even if you, VBACs can be just as traumatic as a C-section can. Any birth can be traumatic. It's just how you perceive your treatment and the events that happened during the birth. And everything was in my control. There was nothing pushed on me that I didn't want. My team was absolutely wonderful. And I never, I never had to advocate for myself. I just did, I just did what I wanted. And 
no one questioned me, which I was very, very thankful for. And I know that's not the case for the majority of women, regardless of the type of birth they're having. Um, I don't know if I just got lucky or if it's because of my preparation or because I just knew how to advocate for myself if I needed to, but I was completely in control and I made all the decisions um, that I wanted to make for me and my baby. So. So after that, you decided you decided you wanted to become a doula and specialize in VBAC and cesarean. Those lessons that you learned, I'm sure you've incorporated that a lot of that into what you do. But when you have a woman now who comes to you and says, listen, I am wanting to have a birth. And at some point, she either decides for cesarean or if you're attending the birth and she is offered a cesarean. How do you support them throughout that time using what you've learned also, not just from your experience, but also from your um, training? Yeah. So if if a client either opts to have a cesarean scheduled or if they end up having a cesarean after going for a VBAC, I really just try to help them understand that it's always good to have, like in the preparation process, there's always, it's always good to have a plan for both options. So even my VBAC clients, I always want them to make a cesarean plan because I want them again to be choosing what they want in the event of a cesarean, because there are ways to make a cesarean less traumatic, um, even more enjoyable. So even in the event of Obviously, if it's a true crash emergency cesarean where mom has to be put under, that is a different situation. But if it's just unplanned, like mine was, where there's time before your C-section's done, there's things that can be done to make it more comfortable for them. And just knowing that they have those options, whether that be having your doula present, some hospitals do allow that, um, having both your partner and your doula present, um, having a clear drape or a lowered drape, um, having music playing, not having your arms stra strapped down, um, breastfeeding and skin to skin while you're being, um, while the C-section's being done after baby's out, all of that can be done. And just knowing that they have options and knowing that a change of plans sometimes is, is necessary and how to navigate the emotions with that and just knowing that ahead of time, this is a potential outcome and I need to mentally and physically prepare for it ahead of time. What you just said is something that a lot of women don't know, that a cesarean can be something different than what they see in dramatic movies where they're rushed mm -hmm. in. The now, so I love the idea of uh, a gentle cesarean, I suppose is what it's called often. Um, and we mentioned a lot of the options that are on offer. But one that I don't know if you um, have seen before or have have um, participated in before is where the baby can be lifted and sort of work itself out. Have you, um, well, that one and also where the mother can lift the baby out? Yeah, so the, like the mother-assisted cesarean. Yeah, so I've seen that a lot more now, um, especially on social media because we all share birth videos and such. I have not been in one um, but I know that especially in I think it's the UK or maybe Australia I can't remember it's more common there um, than in the US and I hope that that becomes an uh, option for more women all over because that can really really help women not feel so disconnected during the cesarean process especially if they're able to assist with bringing baby out into the chest. Well, that's brilliant. Yes, it'd be a wonderful thing to see. I just think it's wonderful, like what you said, when the mother is still actively participating in it, it's not being done to her. She is there willingly and doing it. So that, those are some cesarean options. And what about going and working with women who are looking for a VBAC experience? Yeah, so the number one thing that I tell every client wanting to have a VBAC, VBAC is that they need to make sure they have processed their previous birth experience and that they have, if they haven't completely healed from it, that at least they're on the journey to, because we don't know 
when or how our trauma is going to manifest in the future and for future births. So that is such a big hurdle to get over and the fear um, that surrounds VBAC in general is the biggest obstacle besides not having a supportive provider or a supportive birth team is the fear that surrounds CISA or uh, VBAC because so many women they're not just scared of like uterine rupture or, or VBAC risks they're scared that they're going to try to have a VBAC and they're just going to end in a c-section again and I always tell my clients that it's possible that you'll end up in a c-section again so what are we going to do to prepare for that that possibility because I don't want any woman going into birth and thinking I tried for a VBAC and I had a c-section so I failed it's not a failure it's just a different birth experience and I don't want them to be discouraged from attempting a VBAC because of the possibility of having another c-section so I don't want them to be discouraged by that possibility alone um, for me personally I never even considered a scheduled cesarean. That wasn't even an option for me. Um, for me, the only re way I was having a C-section was if it was truly medically necessary. I didn't care if I labored for 50 hours and then had another C-section. I at least wanted to give my body and my baby the chance to have the birth that I thought we deserved. And there was nothing standing in my way of, of making that happen. And I, I was at peace if I needed another C-section because I knew that it would be my choice. It would be the choice of my provider or anyone else around me trying to convince me to have a C-section. It would be something that I, I opted for um, and that I um, voluntarily chose, so. That's the key. That's the key to avoiding trauma is that you've chosen it. That experience, it can be completely different depending on where your mind is and where your will is. Mm -hmm. So is that a lot of the work that you do with women you'll go through and say, let's figure out what you want. We'll make a plan. But I know a lot of times you also have to be adaptable. Yes. And that's one of the the big things is there's so much uh, negative connotation about birth plans. Like, oh, you can't plan for birth. You can't control birth. No, you can't. But you can have ideas and, and things you want to happen and make a plan A, B, C, and D. Just know in any event that happens, what you would like to do in those instances. And no, this may not be my first choice, but it's a choice I have to make now. So let's figure out the best way to go about that. So it doesn't feel like, like you said, like it's happening to me. I want to be an active participant in it. So, so many women that are trying to prepare for a VBAC, they always think about the physical things, like what I need to do to do I need to eat dates and, and do all this stuff? And I think the biggest thing is mental preparation because your mind is going to give up way before your body does on anything, whether that be birth or running a marathon, like your mind is going to give up first. So preparing your mind and it's not just like, oh, you can manifest the birth you want, <laughs> um, but really just preparing your mind from your previous trauma, preparing your mind for any of the um, instances that can happen in birth and just knowing your why and knowing that motivation behind why you want the birth you want is such a big factor in in not giving up on it um, and really being passionate about your why for what you're wanting. Well, before we, what, what you just said is completely true. And before we finish up, because our time is running out, I want to get this information from you because I think it'd be really important. What are the top three falsehoods or myths that people hear about VBACs? And what are the top three things that you would recommend? I know you just went over it now, but we can get a little bit precise about what you would recommend doing aside from the mindset work that you were discussing in preparation for a VBAC. So the first one is that you cannot have a VBAC with a baby that is large or bigger than your cesarean baby. Um, one of the main things that women are told for why they had a C-section was their pelvis was too small or their baby was too big. And that is just not the case. Women birth big babies um, through their vagina all the time. And I'll just note that my 
the back baby was only half a pound smaller than my cesarean baby. Um, so that's the big first one is you cannot have a VBAC with a big baby. The The second one, it's not necessarily a myth, but uterine rupture is the main thing that comes up with VBAC is the risk of uterine rupture. And of course, there is an increased risk of uterine rupture if you have a scar on your uterus. But I always like to let my clients know that uterine rupture is a, bit, a possibility whether you have a scar on your uterus or not. Um, so really just knowing the signs of uterine rupture, how to decrease your risk of uterine rupture. So we know that the use of Pitocin increases your risk, um, whether you have a C-section or um, prior or not. So uterine rupture is a big thing to navigate, but just knowing that it's a low, low um, chance it's possible, um, but it's not the end all be all for why or why, why you cannot have a VBAC. The third would be that you cannot have a VBAC um, with an unsupportive provider. So I I will mention that it is harder to obviously have a VBAC if your your provider doesn't support you, but it's not impossible. Um, there have been many, many women who have had a VBAC with unsupportive providers. And just for example, my VBAC, I didn't know my OB, I had never met her before, the one that attended my VBAC. So even if you have a supportive provider, you don't know who you're going to end up with, especially if you're in the hospital. So just knowing that it's really more about the choices that you're making for yourself and being able to advocate for yourself and knowing all your options, regardless of if your provider, provider is supportive of you or not. Obviously, it'll be harder, but it's not impossible. And then for the three things that, um, so those are the three things that the myths slash what you want women to know kind of come right together. Yeah. Ah, uh, brilliant. Uh, All right, carry on. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, and then I was going to say that um, the other thing uh, for like having a successful VBAC, I think the number one, even before provider is choosing your birth location wisely. So it depends on the type of VBAC you're wanting. If you're wanting a very, very hands-off, low intervention birth, maybe consider a birth center or a home birth. Um, I mean, I had one in a hospital, but that's not the norm um, to have a hands-off, low intervention birth in a hospital. That takes some um, a mixture of luck and a mixture of a lot of preparation. But consider your birth location wisely because your birth location is going to determine the type of provider you can choose as well. So that's one of the number one things is um, look at the risks and benefits of all the birth locations and choose wisely. And so for women who don't know about the option of a birth center, can you explain the difference between a birth center and a hospital? Yeah. So this is another um, area of confusion. So not all locations will have birth centers, but there's also an in-hospital birth center, which that's just a hospital <laughs> um, labeled a birth center, trying to be a little bit more holistic. Um, and then there's out of hospital birth centers. So those are going to be attended by midwives and they are um, not going to have access to all of the, the things that a hospital has, but it's kind of like a home birth in someone else's home <laughs> um, with a little bit more uh, medical ability, I guess. Um, there's usually nurses there and there might be a different type of midwife attending. So usually those are like certified nurse midwives um, or I guess they could be direct entry midwives as well. But there's a difference between a birth center that's out of a hospital in a hospital. And I don't want people to be confused thinking that they're going to a hospital birth center, that they're going to get the same type of treatment as an out of hospital birth center. Yeah. So um, a hospital birth center or in a hospital, you'd have access to things like an epidural. Stuff yeah, like epidural, C-section, um, yeah. everything, because it's in a hospital. And um, it's if you, medicalized. Yes. And if you're in an out-of-hospital birth center, if you want an epidural, you'll have to transfer. That's right. Okay. Well, I think there's so much more that we could cover, um, to be honest. But a lot of that is the sort of things that you learn in birth classes. So I just want to encourage any woman who is listening to this and is in fertility treatment or is considering getting pregnant or is pregnant, please find yourself a very good um, teacher for this sort of thing. Don't uh, don't just go with your, as they would say in the UK, bog standard approach, as in 
whatever is on offer because a lot of times those hospitals they have so many demands on their time that it's just very difficult to offer a comprehensive class that explains all the options a hospital will explain what they offer but there are many 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 other options yes yeah, sorry you you look like you're about to say something oh and I, I was just gonna say it also I mean hospitals are um have policies and protocols and procedures that would probably inhibit them from giving you all of your options. The hospitals aren't going to promote home birth. So, <laughs> yes. And a hospital is working with its hospital system, but there are alternative systems that you can mm -hmm. look at. So, find a birth class that gives you all the options and educates you enough. But a comprehensive birth class, I can't, I cannot recommend that enough. And if you know someone who's pregnant and you want to give them a fabulous present, buy them a birth class and see if they want to go. All right. Um, we have a lot more that we can study in birth, but I think for today, we'll call that good. Where can people find you if they'd like to communicate with you or follow you or become yeah, a my, my website is um, ebbandflowbirthco.com. And my Instagram is the same, ebbandflowbirthco, as well as Facebook. Those are the primary places people can find me. And then I also have a podcast, The Ebb and Flow Birth Show. So um, those are all the options for connecting with me. Brilliant. And we will tag everything below so that everyone can see and just click and go. That'll be a lot easier. Um, thank you so much, Hannah. We really appreciate your time. And I think it's lovely that you're doing this for the women who really need it because it starts families off on the right footing. So I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> me too. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.